Hello and welcome to Fair Start's first ever Guest Chef Night home event. My name is Chef Wayne Johnson. I'm joining you from the Fair Start Restaurant Kitchen in downtown Seattle. I want to acknowledge that we are on sacred land of the first peoples of C Seattle, the Coastal Salish people, past and present. We honor with gratitude the land itself and the Duwamish tribe. It has been quite a year from navigating the, a global pandemic to continue to fight racial justice. We are standing strong during these t difficult times thanks to the support of our community and people like you. For nearly 30 years, Fair Start has transformed lives, disrupt poverty, and nourished communities through food, life skills, and job training. We started as an organization to provide nutritious meals to our most vulnerable neighbors. We grew to become a workforce development organization that helps youth and, and adults break from cycles of poverty. However, food has always been a common thread in our, wor in our work. When COVID hit, we leaned into food like never before, transforming our kitchens, redeploying staff to make sure individuals and families across Seattle area don't go hungry. To date, we produce two and one half million emergency meals. Now, come on, I've worked in kitchens most of my life, but even I'm blown away by the work our staff has accomplished. We're also supporting our students and graduates through this virtual job training, case management, and wraparound support. We've helped over 100 students and graduates find jobs just in this past year. The way we do our work may look a little different right now, but we know how important these programs are for sustaining and transforming lives. It's been over a year since we held our last in-person guest chef night. We are thrilled to be back on a virtual version featuring some of the best chefs in town. I mean, the lineup of chefs is off the chart. Our goal is to support our local chefs and restaurants, build community, and have fun. Just like the best guest chef nights before COVID. While our students and graduates couldn't be here in the kitchen tonight, many are joining us virtually. I want to give a huge shout out to our sponsors for making this evening possible. Thank you to Canlis, DocuSign, Nyamo, and World Food Market for your generous support. While this event is completely free, if you want to support Fair Start as well, we welcome your donations at fairstart.org. Your support helps fuel our mission. And tonight, it's all about chopping like a pro. We'll be learning the best tips and tricks for a good cut. We'll also be following all the COVID safety protocols thanks to our on-site COVID safety expert. You'll see me in a mask most of the evening and safely social distance from our guest chefs. Please know that our guest chefs are also socially distanced. Our film crew is masked and social distanced as well. We take personal health and safety seriously, and we hope you do too. This evening event is broken up into two parts. We have basic and advanced knife skills. We provided a shopping list ahead of time for folks who want to practice alongside of us. It's about quality, not quantity. Now let's get this night started. It's my privilege to welcome our first guest chef, Chef Christy Brown from Communion and that brown girl cooks. Chef, tell us a little bit about yourself. Oh, thank you so much for having me. Such a wonderful thing to be in the kitchen with you again. My name is Chef Christy Brown and I'm the chef, like he said, of Communion Restaurant and Bar. We're located on 24th and Union and we also have a catering company. We call that Brown Girl Cooks. Well, right now um, we're kind of in the midst of making transitions. Pivots, as everybody has become familiar with, is something that we had to learn at the beginning of COVID. So we've been doing a little bit of community kitchen where we are um, oh, yeah, that's right. I can take my mask off now. 
Um, we're doing community kitchens right now where we're feeding about 150 seniors a week. Um, and we provide free meals for them as well. So um, we're doing a little bit, a little bit of a lot right now. Just trying to make sure that we're meeting the need to make sure our employees have hours and jobs to come to and people giving, giving good food to people. That's really part of our mission. So you're gonna, you're gonna show us some of these basic cuts today. I am. I'm, I'm thinking maybe some dicing, julienne. Mm -hmm. um, I'm sure the folks, there's gonna be people following along. Maybe you can just give them those tricks and okay. tips. I'm excited, let's go, let's do it. So I'm gonna start with the carrots. Um, and they're a little small, so I think that's actually perfect because sometimes depending on what store you go to, this may be all you have, or then you might turn around and actually have those big giant carrots, right? So one thing I like about carrots is there's so many uses you can get out of them. So we're gonna use my nice little fancy new knife I got. <laughs> and we're gonna take we have the tips on, and one thing I love about the tips is it makes a really nice pesto. Like a lot of times people wanna use it, it's like kinda throw these away, but you don't have to. You can save that, pulse it up, put a little garlic in it, a little oil, and you got a pesto sauce you can use as a garnish or a dip. So you're starting with a chef knife for this kind. I am, I am. Cause you wanna get something that you can control. Right, something. So I have a smaller um, vegetable knife that I didn't bring today, but I generally have one knife that I use for most things. Great. So I took the, cut the tips off of the carrots, and I'm going to cut the end off, just a little bit of that. And then, again, we can use that for stock or something later. So with the carrots, um, just to be on the safe side, because sometimes when you have two things that are too long, um, your, your object kind of rolls away from you. So I'm gonna cut this in half. And right now what I'm gonna show you is a small dice, and then I'll show you a medium dice. So we have the carrots, and I'm gonna take that and I'm just gonna go through the center of the carrot. Okay, so I have that. And then I'm going to take, and I'm gonna hold that object with my fingers so I can feel safe. I don't want, you know, sometimes I'm going fast and I'm like, okay, no, no, I don't want to cut myself. So if you hold it on the outside of that, you can slip your knife right through that center and cut down into that carrot. And you get, I've cut that carrot into two slices, right? So I'm gonna take it. And then because these carrots are so small, I just have to cut that in half. And again, holding that object really tightly. Um, will keep you from feeling nervous about whether or not the knife is going to go off into a different direction. So I'm going to do that same thing with this side over here. Cut that down. Cut that in the center. And then I'm just going to take my knife, take the middle part of my chef knife, and go down on that carrot. And these are nice tender carrots. So the one thing I see you doing, Chef, is and we do this with our students as well, is make sure that they have that shield to, to, right. to guide them along that cut. Yeah, don't keep your fingers out like that. Kind of keep them. And, and what you're doing is you're holding, I'm gonna move that over a little bit. You're holding those, that carrot with your hands and you're using it as, a, as keeping it away from your fingers. So you can get up a little bit closer but you're brushing up against that part of your finger, you don't have to worry about cutting yourself. Just keep those fingers back and don't get fancy. Try to talk while you're doing it. <laughs> <laughs> you might wanna be quiet on your first time around. So you see you get like a nice little small dice right there for your carrots. And if you use that technique for every vegetable, like if you just keep going with all the carrots and everything, you'll have that same size all the way through it. And same size because? You want uniformity. You want it to look really nicely in your dish. Let them you know, cook together. Yeah. Same time. Yeah. Same time. Definitely. You know, if you have a big cut over here and a small cut over here, and then some of the carrots might be really crunchy, and then the other ones might be a little bit overcooked. Yeah. 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 So that's a, that's a small dice. 
So now I want to show you uh, medium dice. And for those people that probably have their ruler out, right? Mm -hmm. We're probably talking. Oh, are you giving me talk, chest on dimensions? Probably talking around a quarter inch for the sure. small dice. Okay, okay. Yeah. <laughs> Never get a dimension, and and they don't have to be perfect. But some people like to know what's what's right. What's a quarter inch? What's a half inch? And so on. What's an inch? A big dice, right? Right, so right, right. That's okay, a, that's a small dice. That's so good, dimension. <laughs> so now we have our we have the bell pepper, and one thing I like to do is I don't like to waste any part of the product. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna go and from the top down, and I'm holding the sides, I'm not really near that blade, but I'm going down and using that first, like that first quarter of the knife and then just going straight down the side. And if you're feeling uncomfortable, you wanna lay it down once you get that, that's fine. But I still, I'm cutting around the top of that bell pepper. I don't wanna lose any of that. So, Cut down that side. I'm gonna use that bottom part too. Um, I will even, you know, cut a little bit around that so I can get that that side too. Cause why waste it, right? So so good and sweet, especially this time of year. And do do you use some of these peppers in some of your dishes? Of I that do. Communion? I do. I do. I feel like I use it. Um, we did a red beans and rice special, Ooh. so we had some nice. Nice bell peppers in that. Where was I? <laughs> <laughs> um, we also had, we'd use it on our um, kale Caesar salad with our cornbread croutons. So we, um, yeah, we use a fair amount of bell peppers. Oh, we use it in our um, salmon croquettes. Ooh. So yeah, you gotta, you gotta, you gotta come try it. So I got my pieces, right? I got all of that. Didn't waste hardly anything out of that bell pepper. There's a couple of different kind of cuts you can do with this one. First, I'm going to show you the medium dice because that's the easiest one. One thing I don't want is I don't want that, the pith, pithy part of the bell peppers. So I'm going to take that. You can cut away from it if that makes you feel nervous. But really, it's just about holding the item that you're cutting, right? And you take that top part of that knife and just kind of go along the edge. Don't dig too deep into that bell pepper. And... I just get rid of all the little seeds and stuff, right? So I got rid of that. And then you said, if this is a quarter, if this is a quarter inch, so then we're gonna go to the half inch. So we'll go and just cut down the side of the bell pepper, right? I got strips, right? Then I'm gonna hold that bell pepper again with my fingers. I'm gonna go down and get that perfect square. And that's the good part about going from that top down is that you can get a really nice uniformed cut with the bell peppers. And so yeah, now. I, I think what people find is when they look at recipes mm -hmm. and it just says chopped, oh, yeah. right? Sure. And I think generally when you're talking about, when they say just chop your pepper or chop your onion, you're probably looking at a medium dice. Mm -hmm. In most cases. Sure. Yeah. yeah. I would definitely say so. So you got a small dice right there. You got a medium dice. Might as well just go ahead and do a large dice. Sure. Can you put those together? Sure. Uh-huh. Okay. So again, I'm going to go down. I'm going to take that, the pithy part out of there. It's not bad. I mean, you can still eat it, but it doesn't like, it's not cute. How about that part? <laughs> so I cut that down, and then if I just wanted a large, let's say, stew, gonna mm. cut up some bell peppers for like a nice beef stew, then I can get a larger cut. And then here we go. That's a large dice. So now we got, you know, a couple of different sizes, and they're not gonna all be perfect, but that kind of gives you a sense about like the different ways you can use it. This is something that's gonna cook pretty fast, right? And then this is something still, how to hold the knife, aha, okay. So, hmm, I'm a believer, like I know people do it differently. Like some knives you have like this little tuck 
right in here, and that's definitely something you want to keep that finger that holds the knife and holds it secure. So no matter what, if somebody comes and busts, bumps into you or whatever, you still have a good hold on that knife from there, right? But then, I don't know, like, I kind of hold the blade a little bit. I, I think majority, I, I agree. I think most people will grab the, the heel of that knife to, to make sure it's secure mm -hmm. um, and not be so far back on the handle. I, mm -hmm. I was watching you hold yours, and you, you, you have a good grip on it. Yeah, I, I feel like if I'm back this far, I can't really have the control over the blade that I want. And so I want to keep that more, keep up close a little bit more so I know exactly, like, I don't want it to slip out of my hand or anything like that. So um, one other cut we can do, this might be a little bit more fancy, but sometimes, like, you want to get that, that little... You can Skin off. You can put that cut product on that pan if you like. Oh, sure. Pull that over there. You know, I think also when you're talking about how you're holding a knife, mm -hmm. if, if you're holding a paring knife, sometimes people might hold it like a pencil, right? Oh, sure. But sure. I, think, I think when you're talking generally your chef knife, you're going you're gonna to be cutting pretty big product and you want to have yeah. a secure hold on that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. So, well, let's see. What are you going to show Let's us? talk about this, this paring knife business. So we'll get to the potato, and we'll make some French fry cuts with this potato, which is super nice. But you got a little bit of kind of things that are maybe rotten a little bit, getting starting to get a little bit old, and you don't want that as a part of your French fry. It looks kind of brown. So you're going to take that paring knife. And then, again, I still hold it the same way, I think. Like with my um, my finger in this, what is this part called? In the nook. Yeah. Nook. Sure. Okay. So I'm gonna hold hold with my left hand the potato, and I'm just actually going to make slivers because I don't want to lose a lot of the potato just because it has maybe an eye that needs to be cut out or something like that. But I just go down on the side of that where I see, oh, okay, there's something going. I don't want that. And I, and I do use it a little bit like a pencil, right? Like, mm -hmm. you know, oh, okay, here we go. That, there's that eye that's in there, and I don't necessarily want that. So I'm taking it. I don't dig it in too deep. And I'm using my hand to turn the potato. And I got that eye cutting that, right? So there's a few other places, right? I don't necessarily want to have in my nice little French fries. Okay. okay, there we go. So, again, I'm going back to my chef knife. I'm going to hold my potato like I did with the carrot. I'm pretty simple in that way. Um, I'm going to use that. I'm holding it. I'm going down the center of the potato. And I'm using the force, like I'm holding it close so I can use the force to go down completely through the potato. Sometimes when you get nervous, you're like, you don't want to go all the way through, you're scared. No, hold on, hold on, just go all the way down. And so just looking for maybe, I think that's about a half. I like skinny french fries. Okay. So I cut that potato half into two. And this is what we call batonet. And then it looks like you're, now you're going laying it flat so it doesn't roll on you, right. your potato. Right, because okay. I still want it, I want that uniformed cut. So Flat with this, side down. this is sliding a little bit. Maybe that makes you nervous because you're not really familiar with the knife. So that's fine. Just take that off. And then you again, you're going to hold the potato with your thumb and your pinky. And I'm cutting these into about half an inch. Oh, I missed, I missed something. So oh, you didn't see that. Okay. <laughs> and down there. I'm still holding that potato with my thumb, with my thumb and my pinky going down. And then here we go, I got french fries. So literally home fries right there. That's it. I'm going to take that and then you want to keep it in water because you don't want to be messing around. It'll turn brown if you don't. So, and then that last piece, you know, you just take it and cut it so you don't feel nervous about whether or not it's going to slide because that starch makes it slide a little bit more. 
Okay, Chef, how are we doing on time? Doing good. Cool, yeah, cool. All right, next, thinking about like kind of what tools you want to use for what things. And we have our serrated knife here. So I think that we're going to use the serrated knife to make like just some nice slices. You can take that vine right out of there. All right. I'm going to use my paring knife to cut the center around there. You don't have to go too deep for this because you don't want to lose a lot of the tomato. There really isn't anything wrong with the center of that tomato, but sometimes people don't like that texture. I think what I'm liking about this, Chef, is I've seen you use three knives and do a bunch of different cuts already. Mm -hmm. It's pretty awesome. <laughs> I think it's funny because people always like laugh at me because I don't have a lot of knives, and I'm working on it. <laughs> but um, I really feel like these three knives are your general purpose knives. That's really all you need. Maybe one more, like the Deboni knife, like something a little bit thinner hmm. for like gentle meats or fish. But this serrated knife is my friend. And then I, I cut that top off, right? And then I'm just gonna hold it again. Like the more you feel more confident in holding what it is that you're cutting, the less likelihood you're gonna cut yourself. Yeah. And then just take your time. So I cut through here, and I'm just getting a nice thin cut. I, I love that statement. Take your time. Yes. <laughs> People are so fast. They want everything right now. But something like this, look at those beautiful cuts on that tomato, because you're not honking through it. You're actually. Right slicing through it. And if you get a, if your knife is dull, you're gonna get all of the seeds and the juice, which kind of defeats the whole purpose of having a tomato, right? Unless, right, you actually want to get the seeds out of the tomato. So, it's gonna show a little bit of another little oh, cut. Oh, another little trick, huh? Fancy. <laughs> Getting fancy. <laughs> so I'm gonna take that paring knife again, and I cut that, get that little, that out. Then I'm going to cut the tomato in half. Concasse is a process by which what you're trying to do is get these seeds out of it. Maybe you're making it out of a sauce or something. So what I'm basically I'm going to do is I'm going to take it and I'm going to squeeze it. And as I twirl the, the fruit, it's really squeezing out that tomato, right? Now, if you were going to, there's something else you could do. You could do that where you take the skin off as well, okay. right? That's a whole different process. But same, I mean, like, you, the end result is still the same, but you take it, and then you score the bottom of it, put it in some boiling water, and then you can peel the skins off after you pull it out of that hot water. And I think that generally works really well if you're going to make a sauce or something like right. that, because the skin doesn't actually break down in the cooking process, right? Mm-hmm. So I'm getting those seeds out of there, and you'll see once we're finished. Take that out. You got a tomato with pretty much no seeds in there. That's pretty awesome. So I'm going to take that knife again. And I'm just going to, now sometimes you'll see in a recipe, they'll say rough chop. And that's really what that is. Just so before you, just, you cut that one, you already cut it. You're too oh, fast for me. What were you gonna say? I was thinking you could take that where how you had it uh -huh. and scoop the inside. And maybe put like a tuna fish salad, or you could. Oh, stuff, you're okay. You okay, I see. That, right? Okay, I'm gonna rough chop this one. I'm gonna give him what he wants. You get, you know, listen. <laughs> this is Chef Wayne. You got to give him what he wants. He didn't really call me and tell me, ask me, did I want to do this? He was like, you're doing it. I was like, yes, I am. That's right. So I definitely do what he. <laughs> it's usually good stuff, so let's see. You're getting me excited. You're showing all these different cuts and, and <laughs> you're producing things that a lot of times you don't just see on a normal basis. So no, for them to be able to take it to that next this, level. They want to give you the end result, right? Exactly. But the process is so important. So I got, I'm taking all that tomato off, right? We just, I just had tuna. 
I had tuna for uh, for lunch. It was good, too. So I'm taking that knife. I'm holding it in my hand. Now, don't get aggressive, because you can stab yourself. And that's not what you want. So I'm going down. I guess down. if you're nervous, you could probably do it on the board, too. Sure, right? sure, sure. Go down. And then just use it like a pencil, like you said earlier. Probably need a spoon to get some of that down at the end parts out. But I think I'm doing a pretty yeah, good but, job. But yeah, but the idea that you have like this little tomato bowl now. Sure. There's a lot of different things you can put. Yeah. And it's springtime. So that's... now we're getting back into the salads and everything, which I go. love. So that's super great. Yeah. There you go. Get your spoon and get out some of that bottom parts and then you can put that tuna salad in there. Cool, cool. Let's see then, what do we have. And then did you do a julienne that I missed? Ah, no, we talked about that. We want to do something like, you didn't do fajitas. There okay. you go. Now you're talking up my alley. Ah, okay, okay. <laughs> Taco Tuesday. It's Wednesday. Is it Wednesday? Is it Thursday? I don't know. Thursday. <laughs> so, same thing. Like, one of the things, like, some of my cooks get super irritated with me because I'm like, cut from the top. But with these bell peppers, don't waste it, you know. So I'm holding it. Bell pepper is kind of easy in that way. It has something to hold on to. Um, so I'm going to use my knife again, going down the top. Okay. Going to go down the side. Looking at five minutes. Okay. That, um, that, I love the way you keep, like, Saving all that. Yeah. And yeah. and there's not seeds all over your house. No. <laughs> <laughs> you know, what we do at the restaurant is we make stock a lot. So I, I really, I just love soup. So a lot of times we're doing, we have the waste buckets. So all the skins, the we have the like, we'll take the carrot skins. Mm -hmm. I save all of that. I got like cups and cups of <laughs> onions and garlic you know, I, skins. I know some people because they don't go through a lot fast so they put in the freezer oh yeah until my they bestie, get, until they that's get enough. her thing she she will do our little meal prep have her belt she loves bell, bell peppers and she cuts them up and puts them in the freezer i love it um so here we go we got right. our we got our uh bell peppers and we're just gonna cut down, and we're gonna keep this thin. This is like, man, is this a quarter of an inch? Look at you go, yeah. And then just go slow, but use a little bit of a rocking method. It's kind of like if you use the back part of the knife, that's gonna help you get through that little thick, that skin, right? Here we go. I'm just going slow, cutting up and down that bell pepper. We didn't waste any of that bell pepper at all. We like that. We don't want to waste it. I'm like, I'm like thinking fajita right now. Listen, <laughs> I got my pinto beans on the stove at home. We are definitely, we're having duck tacos tonight. Everybody to Christy's house tonight. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's only one duck. It's only one duck. <laughs> So yeah, and then you got, here you go, you got, I'm going to tell you, I was a little nervous when you asked me to do this because you had uh, Chef Trey when we did the solo Seattle, and he was so fancy with his knife skills. And I was like, hmm. Well, and, and that's the whole idea and the beauty of um, what our students get to learn is because we have a, a ton of different chef instructors that have different styles, and sometimes one style Maybe easier for another student than another one. So um, I love that. I, I yeah. appreciate you bringing that up. And yes, I'm I'm like looking at small dice, medium dice, large dice. Yeah, let's swing it over. Sliced tomatoes. We got we got quite a bit to show off. We learned today. Okay, so we got our rough chop, right? We got our large dice. We got our medium dice over here. So we're gonna slices. We're gonna. Show everybody that, mm -hmm. and at the same time, we're gonna start to wrap it up. And, okay, okay. And, and I mean, I, I just wanna thank you so much for coming down and doing this. Um, 
I support, I love what you do for our Fair Start and also for the community. Thank you so much, yeah, Chef Yeah, thank you so much for having me. I really appreciate all that Fair Start does. And it's been a wonder to work with you throughout the years. So yeah, anytime you want me back, I'm here. <laughs> Absolutely. <clears throat> As we prepare for the next half of our event with Chef Barron, please enjoy this brief video about Fair Start and some of the organizations we've partnered with this past year. And we partnered to help reduce food insecurity during this pandemic. My name is Gloria Hatcher Mays. I'm the executive director for the Rainier Valley Food Bank. We all want to believe that we are prepared for emergencies, but when they present themselves in this particular way for our food bank, you know, we're all about guests coming to see us, being able to shop for food. And we started to feel really nervous about having people come here. So for the past 50, plus weeks. We've been providing weekly food bags. We've been averaging about 70, 75. And in the early stages of that, we realized we shouldn't be reinventing the wheel. I really need to find the experts who are doing this and Fair Start was one of them. That has grown from just a, an initial small pilot uh, where we were able to take in a few meals and, and have direct conversations with our customers to sort of a, a more robust delivery that happens for us five days a week. It's been helpful for our folks that are quarantining in place and have COVID because it gives us an opportunity to bring them some food to their apartment and they don't have to leave and go someplace and put themselves and others at risk. Fair Start providing that meal allowed us to continue to engage with folks on a regular basis and checking with them. Being able to have some meals that we can deliver to them that are quick and easy and taste wonderful. Folks have their favorites. I know that like meatloaf was a really big hit with people and Fair Start's been able to provide a meal that touches on all of the things that somebody might need to stay healthy. But really at its core, it's only possible because of the generous strength of our community, right? The belief that none of our neighbors should go hungry. Father and a mother who, who all of a sudden can't, don't know when their next meal is coming, but yet here they are heating up a warm meal. That's just an amazing feeling. Like. The world could be falling apart, but if you got dinner covered for that night, you know that your child is going to eat. You know that your family's not going to go to bed hungry. Through food, we do set so many more things that make it possible for people to have resilient lives. And it starts with just a meal. Welcome back. I hope you enjoyed the video. I'm just so proud to be a part of Fair Start and work along such incredible partners to help reduce hunger in our community. If you want to learn more about food security, join us on April 28th, mark your calendar for our Food for Thought panel discussion. Fair Start will be joined with the Rainier Valley Food Bank and the YMCA to talk about how hunger is being addressed during the pandemic. Sign up at fairstart.org. It is now my pleasure to welcome Chef Varen from Seattle Central College. We're coming full circle on this one. Chef Varen used to be the head chef at Fair Start before myself, and he knows this kitchen very well. Chef, thanks for coming down. Uh, I'd love for you to tell the people a little bit about yourself, but I have a question. How does it feel to step back in the Fair Start Kitchen? Chef Wayne, it feels great. It's uh, really an honor to be back here. I think it's, uh, like you said, it's full circle. Uh, nowadays, I'm teaching at Seattle Culinary Academy up there at Seattle Central College, and 
you know, it's a wonderful, wonderful thing to, again, be able to give back to, to students again. And so it was, uh, it's great there. It feels uh, even better coming back here. So. It's, it's amazing. It seems like your life mission has just been training chefs throughout Seattle ever since I met you. Yeah, I've tried my best. You know, it's uh, really a lot of people really helped me to get to where I'm at today. And, you know, it's kind of my opportunity to be able to give back to them. You've done a couple restaurants. Yeah, before uh, before uh, Seattle Culinary Academy, I was uh, the executive chef at Heartwood Provisions. That's where I left. I left uh, Fair Start here to to open up Heartwood, which uh, you know, it's um, it's really tough for the entire industry right now. The restaurants closed uh, indefinitely, and it's uh, it's hard for everyone. But again, you know. In the future, there'll be uh, there's going to be brighter spots. Yeah, but I do remember when you opened. That food was off the chain, dude. <laughs> thank you, thank you. Absolutely. So you're going to do a little. We're we're kicking it up a little bit. We did a little bit of a uh, basic nice skills earlier. Now we have some chicken in front of us. You're going to show us a little bit of uh, butchering. Yep. All right, Absolutely. Chef, take it away. Yeah, going to show you guys a little bit of butchery. Before that, I just want to give. Uh, a quick shout out to my wife, Debbie, for being awesome. Just want to give another quick shout out to uh, Danny Barksdale, who uh, was my sous chef here and is still doing food recovery here. And that was before 2009. So big up to uh, Danny Barksdale. Uh, back to chicken. Uh, chef Wayne asked me to do a few things with, uh, with chicken here. Uh, one of them is spatchcocking. Yes. And so, you what, know. Chef Wayne, why'd you ask me well, for you know, the, that the, specific the, technique? The thing about it, because I remember you go, why, why do you want me to fast cock? <laughs> and I'm like, Chef, I've gotten so many people have called me and asked how could they do a whole chicken quick and what is this fast cock thing? So I'm like, Chef, can you just like demo and show people how, one, how easy it is, and two, that that chicken can cook in half the time of roasting a whole chicken. Absolutely. That's definitely the advantage of, uh, of spatchcocking a chicken. Basically, it just means to uh, butterfly it or to cut out the backbone and then flatten it. You know, when you have a full chicken like this, a lot of times when you go to your local grocery store or whatnot, it will probably be tied up or trussed, right? And then it's roasted. This chicken being probably a five pound chicken might take over an hour in our home ovens. And so yes. with the spatchcocking technique, that cuts down the time considerably. So one of the things that I like to do is remove the backbone from the back area first. And so it's a little bit different than what most people do. I think most people will just stand the chicken up like this and go right down this backbone, cutting out this entire vertebrae. Chef, can I back you up a little bit on yeah. that? So um, you have your set of knives. Yep. How often do you sharpen your knives to do cuts like this? Uh, it depends on how sharp your knife is, really. This one here is a, it's basically a utility knife. It's a Misono UX10. It's one of my favorite knives. It's one of those that uh, it's really sharp. It's stainless steel, so you don't have to worry about it rusting or anything like that. So I, I personally really like it. You could use a chef knife also. It's um, you know, a great tool. This is another boning knife. This is basically almost the same as uh, the one that I have, just with a little bit of a curve on the blade, or a scimitar also. So you know, it's, um, it's just a technique where you can really use any knife that's decent flex, this one being you know, pretty, pretty firm, probably a pretty stiff knife. So great. Yeah. Thank you. All right. So the way I'm going to start it, actually, I start from the inside of the bird and it might be a little bit hard for folks to see, but there is a pelvic bone right there. Okay. And it's kind of triangular shaped and that's kind of what I do first. And so I go right inside and cut right below that. It's sort of a triangular shaped bone. Okay, and I'm gonna do the same thing on this side. So hopefully you guys can see that right there. Mm -hmm. I'm gonna do the same thing on this side. And after I get that bone 
and meat removed, I pop the thigh bone from the socket. And you should hear that sound like that. Okay, now what I'll do is I'll work from the back of the chicken. And as you can see, this part is a little bit more whitish, whereas this part is a little bit more bluish. That's where most of the meat is right there. So I'm gonna kind of trace down and around this part right here that's called the oyster. So, okay. so you're going right down between the light part, which is the, the backbone, and then the dark meat of the thigh, which you just separate it from, sound like the joint. <laughs> Absolutely, yeah. It's basically the hip socket. And so the reason why I do it this way and not a traditional way is I like to extract the oyster, which uh, is this part right here, these two parts. Basically, it's like the love handle of the chicken. You know, it's like the best part, right? So once I pass through some of these tendons and that socket, all of that cartilage, I can basically just pull some of that off like that. So you can see that's the oyster being exposed right there. I'll do the same thing on the other side. Well, I know back in the day, chefs in our kitchen would fight for that oyster. That's right. <laughs> One, because it's got the most flavor, and two, because it stays so moist. Yep. And again, same thing here. I'll just uh, remove that. And once I have the oysters removed, you basically have this part right here. And we're just now going to cut all the way through the ribs and all that. So basically. So you got the lower back and the tail exactly. removed now. Okay. Exactly. So from there, what I'll do is just cut right through the ribs on both sides. So that was the first side right there. So now we'll go on this side right here. All right, so you should have this backbone right here. And Chef Christy and I will probably collaborate. She was talking about a lot of, uh, a lot of um, vegetable trimmings that she uses for stock. Maybe we can make a, a chicken stock with this one. Okay, I love it. We're using everything tonight. That's right. Then from here you have this cavity. And what we'll do now is basically flatten the chicken by turning it over. And we're going to give it CPR. I don't know if it's... Uh, one minute and how many pumps nowadays, <laughs> but you want to really press down and hear that crack that we just heard. At this point, what we're gonna do is remove this breastbone or keel bone. Okay, and so what you could do is kinda break that apart a little bit. And this bone right here, this one's a little bit stubborn, so we'll just trace that membrane right there and we'll just pull this guy out. So I can get my finger right under there and right under this side so, right here. So you're running real close to the, the cartilage and the breastbone so you're not losing any meat. Correct, exactly. Got it. And removing this bone helps in cooking time too. So basically it comes out just like that. Okay, and so that can also be used for that's stock that's as well. That's going in the stock too. Okay. Absolutely. And then from here, you can, if you wanted to, break through that bone just a little bit. And you basically end up with kind of a chicken that's very flat like that. Some people will like to tuck the wings behind there. And there you go. You could roast it like this. You could... Um, that's that's you, some nice work, Chef. So. I'm going to tell you, there's probably people out there going, I've seen it done with scissors before. Absolutely. And so, so you could do it uh, with poultry shears, or if you have a heavy-duty scissors, you could definitely uh, use that. And, and what you're doing, if you do the scissors, you're just following that same line exactly. along the backbone and the dark meat. Yep. And okay. just the way that I do, it's a little bit different because I leave the oysters in there. But if you just wanted to use scissors and cut all the way through, that's perfectly fine. I raise quail at home, actually, and when I go to slaughter them, they're so small that I use uh, scissors just to break right through. Get right through there. Exactly. So there you have it. You have that. I'm going to show you two other ones behind me here. So like everybody this. to Chef Varen's house for quail. <laughs> <laughs> That's beautiful, Chef. Thank you. Nice knife work. 
I just want to show you this one really quick here. Uh, there's uh, after you spatchcock, you could do a few different things. In this way, I took some skewers and poked right through over there and right down here and through right here. And so you could tie it up if you wanted to. You could roast it hanging if you wanted to also. You could put this over a, a wood fire. I really like wood fire, so you could do many different things with that. I, I, I like that skewer idea because then your chicken's going to stay flat through the whole cooking process. Exactly. Where if we put that spatchcock on a bed of vegetables right now, they start to plump and come together. That would leave even cooking throughout your chicken. Exactly. So, that's, great idea. That's one of the reasons. So, And then there's a few other things here that I wanted to show you. This is the gizzard right here, the liver, and the neck. This is normally what comes into um, when you go and buy a chicken at the market, you might have a little bag inside of that uh, inside of that bird, and so that bag contains these giblets, and so these are also great for either stock or sauces. Funny story, my wife, one of the Thanksgivings or Christmases ago, she forgot to take the bag out, so she roasted the entire thing with the bag, and I mean, I guess it flavored the bird, right? <laughs> <laughs> so. That's another way to do it, right? <laughs> right. All right. So next up, Chef Wayne wanted me to uh, show you guys kind of how to break down the bird into a few different pieces. Yeah. The wing, the breast, the um, the drumstick and thigh and all that stuff. So. I mean, that that is really kind of the culinary test when you're going through school, right? Exactly. That's one of the actually knife tests that I give. So in right? the second quarter, so <laughs> they, they definitely, uh, they have to do it in 12 minutes too. So it's definitely tough, so. And uh, there I'll, are- I'll give you 14. All right. <laughs> <laughs> there are many different ways to uh, break down a chicken. Lots of people will start from the hind quarter right here. Some people will take out the wings first. I generally like to start on the breast side right here. So I kind of cut to the left or the right of the keel bone, and that's what I'll do first. Hopefully you guys can see. And I see you like that smaller, manageable knife. Exactly, when yeah. You, when I, you're I doing prefer, that work. I prefer a small knife in general. So you can kind of see there's the keel bone right there, or the breast bone. I'm going to go on either side of it. And there is another bone up here that everyone knows at the front right here. And this is your collarbone or wishbone. So what I'm going to do is just work my way down. I'm just using the, the first inch of the knife just to flick the tip of the knife just through the rib cage and all that, just to get as much meat off the carcass as I can. And so the way that I like to do it is to take half of the chicken off of the carcass at a time. Okay. okay. And so right when you get here, you'll see the wishbone connect to this other bone, and that's where your drumette bone is, which is this one right here on the wing. So that's where I'll separate. And go right through all those tendons. After that, I move back here And I'm going to work on the thighs. And remember that bone that we cut right under, this uh, pelvic bone right there. Mm -hmm. This is the one that we took, that we cut under when we were doing the spatchcock. So I cut right through there. So again, it should look somewhat like that. And then we pop the thigh bone from the socket. So that's kind of how I do it. And then I start from the back again, kind of like how I showed you how the spatchcocking technique was. I feel like you're saving that oyster again. I am, exactly. That's, uh, <laughs> that's the best part. And all you have to do is go past the cartilage and some of those tendons, and you can just pull that out. And there's your oyster right there. So I'll just scoop that out. And once I have that, I'll flip it back over and just cut 
the half chicken off the carcass. So there you have uh, your half a chicken. I'll do the same thing on the other side. Chef Wayne, how do you uh, how do you like to cook chicken well, at home or for a barbecue? I'm, I'm, well, I love barbecue, but I'm I'm from the, my I was born in Kentucky. My mom did fried chicken like nobody's business. Nice. I'm still trying to master that, but I love my <laughs> fried chicken. There we go. Who doesn't? So, quick time. All right, so I'm doing the same thing to the other side. I'm just working my way down, around, and I'm gonna work that oyster out of that socket. So, so we're getting a, a, a question that, I, I, I know we said we can, once we do the spots cut, we can save time in cooking. Generally, yeah. what do you think, 50%? I would say probably as far as time. Yeah. So, if uh, if that. So five, from an hour to forty minutes. I would think so. An hour to forty, hour to thirty-five, even. Depends. So so if you had the whole chicken, it's probably gonna take you an hour to roast that whole thing. Exactly. And then when you do the spots cut, maybe forty, forty-five minutes. I would think so. Yeah. So you're gonna save fifteen, twenty minutes. Yeah. Which is it, huge if you know you're busy and you know you have a lot of stuff to to do and manage. So. This is uh, the half chicken right there, and we're just gonna break down the, basically, the hind quarter, and, and or the leg, basically, and this the, would the, be. The one thing I wanna note, Chef, before you get too far, is that you yeah. actually bone that breast. Exactly, yep. Off so, of there, so it's a boneless breast. Yep, so it's actually boneless right now, and there's actually a tender tucked right in there. And so this is, uh, you know, if you bred these, kids love them. It's like uh, chicken nuggets, but better, right? There you go, chicken tender. Chicken tender. So there's that. I'll do the same to this side and remove that tender as well. So there's that. Some people will keep this as a leg. What I like to do is trim that large amount of skin right there. And we don't typically throw away any chicken trim. We use it all for stock. If you want to break it down from drumstick to thigh, what I like to do is hold it at 90 degrees and cut right into that joint. So this is your, you're at a quarter chicken right now. Exactly. The, the thigh and drumstick is, I guess, a fourth of the chicken. Yep. <laughs> and so there's that. Nice. And there's your thigh. We'll probably do the same to this one. How's our time look, Chef? Great. Yeah. Yeah, Great. Really, I'll keep this one for shape. a second. Good if uh, if we have time, I'll show you something. Uh, this one here, basically, you can just scoop the wing out. So this is a, an entire wing. What you could do is fold that back, and you could fry that up. You could, uh, you know, smoke it. You could do anything like that. I'm going to take off some of that excess skin. Same thing to this side. At, at, at one of the restaurants I worked at, we would fry it and then uh, three different sauces, right? So nice. Hot sauce, teriyaki. Nice. And the sweet and sour, so it was, it was fun. Great, so there's your, uh, your wings right there. And then we have two breasts. You can keep the skin on, which is uh, great, or you could take it off. And if I take the skin off and I wanna make crispy skin as a garnish or something, what I like to do is I like to remove some of this fat. There's a lot of fat right there. So I'll take a little bit of it off, like so. I'll save that for stock. And what you could do is you could take this skin and put it in between a silpat, one of those silicone mats that you can bake with, and bake it at 350 degrees until it's crispy. It could be 20 minutes or something like that. So it's a good way to utilize every part of the chicken. So we have your boneless breast there, and I'll just trim some of the fat off a little bit. And there's that piece. This one, we can probably leave skin on just, uh, just to show the difference. And just clean it up a little bit. I like that nice, consistent shape. We'll run into our last five minutes there. All right. But 
what, what I'm looking at and what I'm liking is I see, I see how you have broken it all the way down. You've taken skin off the breast. Um, you still have a quarter, looks like a um, leg and thigh there. Yeah, I think we have a little bit of time left, so I'm going to show you how to debone this, actually. That's and awesome. So we have yes. a, a thigh bone right there and that drumstick bone. So what I'll do is cut directly on top of the bone and then kind of let the knife fall on either side. And then again, follow the drumstick bone down. You know, we were talking a little bit earlier with the, the paring knife, how you just use that tip like a pencil, and I'm watching you like you're almost drawing exactly. alongside of that bone. Exactly. So I, I get my finger right under there, and I cut right below the drumstick, basically severing the Achilles. And then I just basically scrape down that meat. I'll kind of do the same with uh, the thigh bone here. Kind of go around the oyster up top. And then just scrape. So Chef, I know we only have a couple minutes, but I want to ask you this. Yeah. So when the, when the students are like learning this, yeah. do you lose a lot of chicken? No, not at all. They, they actually do a really good job. So you, you know. slow them down and you make sure that they do it right. Yep. Each student's get about a case and a half to two cases, which is about like 12 birds yeah. around there, 10 to 12 birds, and they do a great job. Yeah, it was, uh, it, the test is really hard, right? But when they're doing it for production, um, for lunch and all that stuff, they actually really do a great job. So here you can kind of see the thigh bone and the drumstick bone, and right here, you got to be careful that you also take the kneecap with you. I really like to eat the kneecap because it's crunchy and cartilage, <laughs> but a lot of uh, cultures don't prefer it, and that's, uh, that's right there. But again, this will be used for stock. And this part nice. here is great because you can trim it down, you could marinate it, you can grill it, you can do many different things. I'm making sure that there's no bone. There's a little piece of cartilage that I'm going to take out. You know, I've actually seen people take that, pound it, flatten it out, and, and roll it, tie it, and, and bake it. Exactly, yeah. You could even, uh, if you take out some of the meat and make it a little bit flatter, you can actually fill it with some force meat, like sausage filling or something like that, or stuffing, and roll it up, tie it, and make some, uh, make some cool things with it. Well, so. well we're, we're definitely going to do another course on how you, how you make sausage and force meat, so, but... Chef, I am so pleased that you, one, are back here in the kitchen with us, and two, this is some beautiful work. I mean, thank if, you. If, if I need chicken broke down, I know who to come to now. All righty. <laughs> thank you <laughs> thank very you much. Thank you so much. I think, thank you for what you're doing. Thank you for, you know, being here for Fair Start and teaching the students. You know, I appreciate that. Absolutely. Thank, thank you, you so for much. having me. Appreciate it. I also want to give a really big thanks to Chef Christy Brown with the small dice, medium dice, Julianne. And my heartfelt thanks goes out to all of you, all of you spending your night with us tonight. Please join us for our next Guest Chef Night at Home on Thursday, May 20th. Mark your calendar. It'll be a powerhouse night. We're bringing in Chef Melissa Miranda of Musain and Rachel Yang of Jewel and Revel to demonstrate the art of appetizer. Register by going to fairstart.org. And finally, finally, Fairstart can't do its work without the support of the entire community. If you can please donate, volunteer, or help spread the word about our work, you can definitely learn a lot more at fairstart.org. And I just want to say thank you, thank you, thank you and have a good night.